This is a video that has been very highly demanded for years. Some people were interested just because they want to know my opinion, some people disagree and want to hear what I have to say, and other people just like these sort of video essay type videos. I'm not sure if video essay would be the right word for this type of content, but it's the best word that I got, so. And by word, I mean two words. But anyways, <laughs> for a long time I wasn't sure if people would actually watch it despite what the comments were saying. But a few months ago I made a video talking about Chihiro from Danganronpa and people seemed pretty interested in that. And I also made a video talking about Athena Sykes and breaking down her character design. And both of those videos were received pretty well so I figured, you know, maybe it's time. <laughs> maybe it's time for this. And so I'm going to be breaking down the writing of Juvia's character and a couple of disclaimers before we get into it. First of all, well, there's the obvious. This video will contain spoilers for all of Fairy Tale, and there will be minor spoilers for the 100 Year Quest sequel. And another disclaimer, if you're a person who loves Juvia, either don't watch this video or watch this video with a very open mind, because I'm sure you're a lovely person, but if Juvia is your favorite character, there's a lot that we disagree on, so. <laughs> I also want to preface this video by saying I'm not telling you people to not like this character. If you like this character, fine, whatever. This is just me as a writer breaking down the writing of Juvia as a character with my own opinion sprinkled in here and there. If these sorts of videos aren't your thing, then no problem. I'll see you in the next one, but for those of you who are interested, let's get into it. Roll the intro. Hello and welcome back to my channel. Hope you're doing well. I've never said roll the intro before, I don't think. It feels very strange and new. <laughs> Any longtime viewers of my channel will know that Fairy Tale has been my favorite series for forever now. And even though over the years I have been gravitating more towards other series and different franchises, will I ever learn the plural of franchise? Even if over the years I've been gravitating towards other stuff and there are things that are currently my favorite, Fairy Tale will forever and always have a special place in my heart and I'll always think fondly of it. That said, it is far from perfect. <laughs> and one of the issues that I've had with Fairy Tale pretty much since day one was Julia. And considering how large of a series fairy tale is, there are definitely some things that I'll probably end up leaving out, but I did do some research, and by that I mean flipped through my fairy tale manga and jotting down notes. <laughs> I definitely made notes of all of the more significant parts of Juvia's character, but I have no doubt that there are some things that I missed. Considering how long of a series fairy tale is, I couldn't reread all of it before this video. I just had to flip through and hope for the best. So if by the end of this video you have a different opinion, please let me know. As long as it's a, a, a chill, civil comment don't come for me. To me, Juvia has always been the epitome of a poorly written romance and a poorly written female character. And as I was making my notes and trying to organize them, I decided to put this in two, three major categories. So we're going to be touching on plot relations, like what ties Juvia to the plot of Fairy Tale, her general personality, and how the writing of her character affects the writing of other characters. Hello, it's Editing Oliver. I am editing this audio right now and also recording this little thing for the fourth time now because I was recording it for the third time and immediately fucked up. I love my life. <laughs> but anyways, as I was recording the audio for this video, I realized I sort of unconsciously ended up adding two other sections to this video, so I will now dub those sections things I thought were done well, which is pretty self-explanatory, but there are parts of Juvia's writing that I did really like and kind of appreciated, but unfortunately, due to whatever reasons, they weren't delved farther into, which is unfortunate. And then the last section that I will dub the elephant in the room, which will become a lot more clear what that is as the video goes on. But anyways, back to Mother Oliver. Hopefully I won't have to record another one of these because my god am I struggling right now. <laughs> there isn't any real order to this list, it's just what I found easiest to organize in my notes. But now that I'm looking about it, I think we're gonna talk about a personality first because what's well, life without a little bit of spice? I made an outline, but fuck the outline. We're just gonna do whatever we want today. <laughs> So we'll start with talking about her personality. And immediately, when I started watching Fairy Tale, that was my problem with her. Because <laughs> that's the thing with Juvia. Think about her as a character. What do you think about? She's a water mage in Fairy Tale. She likes Grey. And that's about it. <laughs> Her personality is that she likes Grey, and when you think about it, we don't really know much more about her other than that. I 
think the best way I can explain this is by comparing the ship of Grey and Juvia to other popular ships in the fairy tale fandom. Long time readers of fairy tale are probably much aware of the big four. So let's go through those and talk about each character involved in them. Of course, we have Natsu and Lucy. Let's think about them as their individual personalities. We've got Natsu, right? He likes eating, he likes fighting, and he likes sleeping. He's a fairly simple guy at heart. He would do absolutely anything for the people that he cares about. He's also very respectful of how other people feel. I think a great example of this is in the Tower of Heaven arc, where Simon wants Natsu to go help Urza fight Jalal. While eventually he does go, that's mostly because he finds out that Urza's life is at risk. Before that, he understands that that is very much Urza's fight, and it's something that she needs to do in order to overcome her past. And then we got Lucy. She can definitely be a little hot-headed at times, maybe a little bit short-tempered, but she's definitely a very good person at heart. She grew up in a place where, after her mother died, she didn't feel she got much love, and so she really aspired to be a part of fairy tale because she just really needed to seek out that community. Now that she has found a family of her own, so to speak, she definitely tries to share that love with other people, encourages them to find their own found family in a way. Phantom Lord was hired to essentially kidnap Lucy and bring her back home, but everybody in Fairytale fought really hard to keep her there. That was kind of a big moment for her because she essentially realized that she finally found a place where she belongs. Urza has been pretty guarded from emotions for a lot of her life, and that of course has to do with her past being in the Tower of Heaven, forced into child enslavement, you know, all that fun stuff. <laughs> and then after being betrayed by who she considered to be her closest friend, she essentially shut off her emotions, at least when it comes to expressing them towards other people, and it took a lot for her to be able to actually express those sides of herself. She's super tough, super strong, super brave, but also has a bit of a soft side. And then we've got Jalal, person who was possessed by quote-unquote the spirit of Zerif for many of his life, <laughs> much of his life, grammar. You know what I mean. <laughs> and since he wasn't in control of his own actions for a large part of his lifetime, he ended up hurting a lot of people that were closest to him. And then eventually, when he does regain control of himself again, after some brief amnesia and struggling to accept that he was in fact the person who hurt everyone closest to him, he eventually takes matters into his own hands and tries to atone for his past actions best he can. Levy and Gajil is a bit of a different situation, to be honest. And not going Going to get into it too much because honestly it's an entirely different discussion. Gajil has plenty of personality on his own, but to be honest I feel like Levy is almost in a similar camp as Juvia. Considering she existed before Gajil did, she does have a bit more of personality to her. We know she's a bookworm and she's known for being real smart, but honestly a lot of her character has been reduced to being a love interest for Gajil, which is unfortunate, but to be honest I don't think it's as bad as Juvia's case. But that brings us right back around to Grey and Juvia. We think about Gray is a character. He's a pretty laid-back guy, except for when it comes to fighting Natsu. <laughs> he also has his own past demons that he has to fight. Pardon the expression, I didn't mean to do that, oh my god. And a big theme with Grey is that he has had a lot of experience of losing people that he's loved in the past. And as such, as he continues to grow older, a big reason that he fights is to protect the people that he loves in the present day, so then that way he doesn't have to go through that loss anymore. And essentially, when it comes to Team Natsu, I think he's a great addition and that really helps to balance them all out. We've got Natsu, high energy, spicy boy. <laughs> we got Lucy, who starts off as a bit of a newbie and kind of feels a little out of her element at first. We've got Urza, who's big, strong, and stoic. And then we've got Grey, who is a lot more laid back and a lot more relaxed than the other members of the team. And then that leads us to Juvia. If we think about her personality, what do we got? She is really in love with Grey. And that's about it. <laughs> if we take Natsu and Lucy and we separate them, they're still their own characters. And the same can be said for Urza and Jalal, Gajiel and Levi. And then if we do the same for Grey and Juvia, Grey still very much stands on his own as a character. But if we remove Grey from Juvia, essentially most of Juvia is also removed as a character. And don't get me wrong, romance isn't a bad part of a character. In my opinion, a big part about it is how romance is used with that character. It's a lot more telling. I guess would be the best way to say that than the actual romance part itself, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. <laughs> but if having a romantic interest is all there is to a character, it very quickly just makes the character seem very bland and very 
fake and very uninteresting. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's a little bit more acceptable to have a character exist solely as a romantic interest if the genre is romance, like a romantic drama or a romantic comedy. But that said, even in those instances, it's still very important that you have a character have a personality and hobbies and goals and ambitions outside of that romantic part of them. It makes them seem a lot more human and a lot more three-dimensional. And let's be honest, we know very little about Juvia's character outside of Grey and that is what the problem is. Once Grey is removed from the equation, we don't really know much about her. And there have been a lot of points throughout the story of fairy tale where there was that opportunity where we could explore those sides of Juvia, but they were just very rarely taken advantage of and thus we have the Juvia that we have today. Now would be a great time to talk about her plot relations, which was originally going to be my first point, but is now my second point. If we go through the plot of fairy tale, most of the reason that she's there ties back to Grey somehow. And honestly, it would be easier to list all of the non-Grey related situations that she's been in, and that would be her first introduction to her character. Brief if it was, she was not there for Grey. Her general backstory of being followed by the rain, her fight with Fidaldus during the Tower of Heaven arc, and then her role in the Battle of Fairy Tail arc. Everything else ties back to Grey somehow. Of course, after she's first introduced in the series, she fights with Grey. She ends up even existing in the Tower of Heaven arc because she followed Grey. Grey might not be the sole reason that she joined Fairy Tail, but he's definitely a big part of that. During the Tenro Island arc, her fight with Meldy completely revolves around Grey. Her actions during the Grand Magic games have a lot to do with Grey. During the Tauros arc, she ends up getting dragged into the whole gray silver situation and then her entire actions and role throughout the final arc of fairy tale has to do with gray and much like her personality if we remove gray from the scenario a lot of her reasons for being involved in the plot just completely disappear there are definitely situations where she is included in the plot of her own accord even so a lot of her actions in the non gray related parts of her character still tend to tie back to gray somehow i think the best example for this is the Tenro Island arc. Master Makarov chose Juvia to participate in the S-Class trial, so then that way she can raise her rank in the guild and become an S-Class wizard. While she is a part of that arc because Makarov chose her specifically, her first instinct was wanting to pull out of the trial, so then that way she can become Grey's partner. Which, as a side note, kind of always rubbed me the wrong way because wizarding is essentially their careers, right? So she's just given an opportunity to further herself in her career and become a bit a better wizard. <laughs> but instead, she would rather just drop out of that, so then that way she can chase her romantic interest. Which in itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, I think it's just in addition to everything else about her character makes me just roll my eyes a little bit. If that was just a one-time thing, I don't think I would really mind, but it's not. This is a recurring theme and it gets very exhausting. <laughs> and then she was eventually eliminated during the first round of the S-Class trial. Then after she lost, the group of Urza, Mira Jane, and Lazana started showing concern for Wendy because they started to think about Nest and how he's just a little shady. <laughs> Juvia offered to go find them, but in reality, she just wanted to go and find a gray and the only reason that she ended up actually looking for Wendy, who was potentially in danger, instead of going and finding Grey, is because Urza ended up tagging along. Then during the Grand Magic Games arc, Makarov did choose her to be part of Fairy Tale Team B, but then throughout the course of the Grand Magic Games, a lot of her actions tended to be more revolved around Grey than actually focused on winning the Grand Magic Games for the sake of their guild. The reason that she was so set on winning is because Makarov said that whoever won, but whether it was Team A or Team B, can essentially just ball around the other team for the day and Juvia wanted to just be able to do whatever she wanted with Grey and that was why she was trying her hardest. And then when she was chosen for one of the games, instead of focusing on actually winning, she tried to impress Grey, named a move after him. He wasn't super jazzed about it and then she lost because she that's, that's where her focus was. Hello, editing Oliver again, still editing the audio. Something that I can't believe that I forgot to mention is that Juvia is a water wizard, right? The games she lost was a water-based game. And so I have absolutely no doubt that Juvia very much could have won that game if she was actually focused on winning instead of trying to impress Greg. But you know, we all, we know how that went. She had the advantage and was fully capable of performing really well, but she didn't 
because she wasn't focused on doing well. She was focused on Grey. Anyways, just thought I'd throw that in here. So even during the parts of Fairy Tale where she isn't included in the plot because of Grey, a lot of her actions and a lot of her motivations still tie back to Grey. I do think that this would be a lot less exhausting, again, if it was a romance genre because the whole point of romance is for two characters to like each other. <laughs> but aside from needing a personality other than liking a person, they also need to have their own story and their own goals throughout the story. I think another reason it might be less exhausting is if there were less cast members. Fairy Tale, without a doubt, has at least hundreds of characters. <laughs> There's a lot. If there was only a handful of characters, I feel like Juvia's actions would be just a little bit more understandable because who she has to interact with is a lot more limited. But even if we just limit it to the Fairy Tale Guild itself, there are still so many characters for her to interact with. And even on the times where she is seen interacting with them, she's always talking about Grey. <laughs> she's always just focusing on Grey. There are very few times where she actually tries to get to know the other characters of Fairy Tale and tries to open up to them herself. So just like her personality, if we remove Grey from the equation, most of her reasons for being included in the plot disappear, most of her goals and aspirations disappear, most of her personal actions disappear, and essentially she just barely exists without Grey as a character. And then of course there's the issue of how her writing as a character affects other characters' writing. But characters, I mean character, I'll give you one guess as to who it is. It's Lucy! I'm kidding, it's Grey. Even if you are a more recent viewer, you should know that I'm quite fond of Grey. He's been my favorite character for forever now. I hold him dear to my heart and he is my son and I will protect him. <laughs> and so I'm sure you can imagine how frustrating it is having Grey be your favorite character and then have Juvia be at least one of your least favorite characters. And especially as a writer, it's more frustrating because I can't help but look a little bit deeper into the writing of them and to watch the writing of your favorite character just kind of go into the toilet is more more than a little frustrating. <laughs> if we look at Grey at the beginning of Fairy Tale, and we look at Grey by the end of Fairy Tale, he almost feels like two completely different characters. And that in itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, because you know, we love that sweet, sweet character development. But sometimes it doesn't even really feel like Grey by the end of Fairy Tale, because that's how much of a complete 180 his writing does for the sake of trying to make this romance work. I think the most notable part is during the Grand Magic Games arc, towards the end when they're all celebrating that they all didn't die. <laughs> Grey and Juvia start talking about the eras of Juvia and the new eras of Grey. Juvia tries to do her own Juvia thing. <laughs> tries to tackle him in a hug and he rejects it, which isn't something that he necessarily has done before. Not that he liked it before, but <laughs> he was always a little bit reluctant to deny her advances in that way for the sake of sparing her her feelings. And this is the first time where he straight up rejects her and then explicitly states that he doesn't like her behavior towards him. He said that he's going to start stating whenever he doesn't like something and that he isn't going to tolerate that sort of behavior essentially. And then Juvia responds by just ignoring that <laughs> and after she ignores it, Grey immediately starts showing discomfort again, because why wouldn't he? Throughout the course of the story, he has shown discomfort. He's very clearly uncomfortable with the things Juvia says and does regarding him. And then even after this situation, he still continues to be uncomfortable by the things that she says and does to him. And then by the end of Fairy Tale, they start hinting at a romance between them. And then during the 100 year quest of Fairy Tale, they definitely are heading in that direction to make them an official couple. And I haven't read much of the 100 year quest, mind you, because it's I don't have much time anymore. <laughs> but still, from the little that I do know about it, that is something that they are going for. It just is it's very confusing because he very clearly showed discomfort for the way that she was treating him, even to the point where he just straight up tells her he doesn't like it. And if he is truly uncomfortable with her actions, then why is he pursuing a romance with her? And if he is pursuing a romance with her, why was he so serious about being uncomfortable with the way that she treats him? And if he is so serious about being being uncomfortable with the way that she treats him, why is he so dismissive of it afterwards when she just disregards his feelings on it? It's very confusing. <laughs> it really, really muddies down his character and makes him a bit of a pushover in a way. It creates very confusing conflictions within his character, and it's not even in an interesting way that makes you want to learn more about it and try and figure it out. It just kind of makes you scratch your head. Hi, it's Editing Oliver once again. It's crazy how I said I didn't want to do this anymore, and yet here I am doing it for the third time. <laughs> I have also seen the argument over the years that Grey can be categorized as 
as a tsundere, which I very much disagree with. If you aren't aware of what a tsundere is, I'll put the definition on screen now, but the gist is, you know those characters at anime where they'll do something nice for somebody and then be like, but it's not because I like you, and then they'll like go out of their way to try and be nice to them or spend time with them, but then act like they don't like them. That is very different from how Grey acts. When a character is a tsundere, they don't tell their supposed love interest that they're creepy and that they don't like the way that they treat them in a very serious way. They don't say that they're uncomfortable. They don't look uncomfortable. Basically, if Grey were a tsundere, he would kind of be trying to hide the fact that he actually likes the attention that Juvia is giving him, but throughout all of Fairy Tale, he never gives off that impression. It's just discomfort and sometimes disgust. And another aspect of Juvia's character that I couldn't really find a place to put it, so I'm just gonna put it in here, is the use of the word Sama after Grey's name. And for those of you who have not read many a manga in your life, <laughs> Let me teach you about them real quick. Just a quick little lesson on my limited knowledge of the Japanese language. In English, we have things like sir and ma'am and mister and missus. And Japanese honorifics are basically that, but a little bit more expanded. There's san, which is essentially mister or missus. It's usually used for like bosses and stuff, or if you're meeting somebody for the first time, you would add san to the end of their name, as not to be rude. There's chan and kun, which are used amongst friends. Kun being the masculine version and Chan being the feminine version. And then we also have Sama, which is essentially like a godlike thing. Like I believe Kami-sama is how people refer to Japanese gods or god, I don't know about Japanese culture that much, but essentially it's putting Grey on a very, very high pedestal. And the main issue with this is that it's really only with Grey. <laughs> there are definitely characters who have similar speech patterns to Juvia. And I think the best example within Fairy Tale itself would be Jura. He refers to everybody with the honorific of Dono, which basically just shows really high respect. And that is how he refers to every character, even Happy, who's the little blue talking cat. <laughs> Juvia only uses the Sama honorific with Grey, which is very unhealthy in terms of, I was gonna say in terms of a romantic situation, but honestly in most situations. <laughs> of course you always want to think highly of your significant other if you're in a relationship with them. It kind of rubs me the wrong way, I'll put it that way. <laughs> and again, it, if it was just on its own for like some sort of comedic effect, I would probably think a lot less of it, but it's just another one of those things where in addition to everything else that is going on with her character, it makes it very hard for me to overlook that sort of thing. And now I've talked a lot about Juvia in a bit of a negative light, but contrary to popular belief, I don't completely hate her character. And I actually think that she has had so much more potential than she was given, which is just truly such a shame. I think her introduction as a character was really cool. It was slightly ominous and from the moment she appeared on screen, I was really curious to know more about her, especially after finding out that she uses water magic. I've always loved water type Pokemon in the water tribe from Avatar, so I was hyped. <laughs> And then even though her battle with Grey made me roll my eyes just a little bit, <laughs> I was kind of overlooking that because as we learned more about her and we found out her backstory about how the rain has always followed her and how people always tended to not like her very much because of that, and then eventually ending up with the Phantom Lord who supposedly welcomed her to the guild with open arms despite her always being followed by the rain. I was into that. <laughs> I was super into that. And I really wish that that was touched on a lot more. Why did the rain follow her? Why did that happen? Happen? Like, is there a reason for that? And also, what was it that led her to Phantom Lord? What was her experience in the Phantom Lord Guild? How different was it from Fairy- I mean, it was pretty different from Fairy Tale, but how was her experience with Phantom Lord Guild members versus her experience with Fairy Tale Guild members? Those are things that I would really love to learn about Juvia, but all of that was just completely thrown out the window for the sake of making her a comedic relief, romantic interest for Grey. And I think another really interesting part of Juvia's character was during the Tower of Heaven arc, when she she was teaming up with Lucy to fight Vidaldis. And while she does mention Grey and continues to call Lucy a love rival and it gets a little exhausting after a while, it was during this fight that she ended up doing a lot of self-reflection. Over time, seeing how fairy tale guild members interacted with each other, she really grew to love that sort of energy that they had. She really loved and admired how everybody in fairy tale just cared about each other so endlessly, and she desperately wanted to be a part of that. She started reflecting on her past actions during her Phantom Lord days and started feeling a lot of doubt. She wasn't sure 
if she would be accepted and she wasn't sure if they could forgive her for the things that she's done. And then that sort of line of character development is also brought in through the Battle of Fairy Tale arc when her and Kana end up being trapped in one of Freed's ruins. Instead of choosing to go through with the rules and fighting Kana, she ended up sacrificing herself, putting her own life in danger for the sake of giving Kana a way to take down the enemy, essentially. Not only did she just not want to fight somebody that she saw as her friend, but she also wanted to prove herself to the guild and show them that she has changed for the better. And that regardless of how they see her, she does love everybody in the guild and doesn't want to hurt them. And that was so good. That like made her seem so much more human. And the Battle of Fairy Tale era of Juvia is probably my favorite because that is when we see the most development in her character and we see more of her rather than her love for Grey. And the last part where I can really give Juvia credit as a character is during the Meldy fight. Despite being tied to the plot, because of Grey, and the only time she really gets serious, so to speak, in that fight is when Grey's life is threatened, she does end up using her love for Grey to help Meldy. Meldy viewed the character Ultir as a mother, and she was essentially ready to end her own life for the sake of helping Ultir get revenge on Grey. But then Juvia ends up using her love for Grey and comparing it to Meldy's love for Ultir, and essentially teaching her that you have to live for the people that you love, and that love can be so much stronger than hate, which Meldy held a lot of hate for Grey at the time. And earlier when I said that it kind of depends on how you use a character's love, this is what I'm talking about. Even though it still has a lot to do with Grey, and a lot of Juvia's character in this moment still ties back to Grey, despite her freaking out for a moment there <laughs> and being a little creepy, it's a much more real portrayal of love. A lot of Juvia's character seems just like a really strange caricature of a girl in love, but this one seems a lot more real and a lot more emotional, and a lot more of how romance in media should be portrayed. And then the last thing for me to mention is during Grey's fight with Silver, and Juvia ends up killing the necromancer who is controlling Silver, despite knowing that that would bring a lot of pain to Grey for losing his dad for the second time. During that moment, she sort of put doing what was right over her own personal feelings and it was probably a really hard decision to make and I can kind of applaud her for that moment. And so despite her character being completely tied to Grey in most places, there are definitely some situations where that is used in a more positive way, I guess. And even if the situations themselves aren't necessarily happy, it's a lot more real and makes me feel for her just a little bit more. And so you might be thinking, well if you like those things about Juvia, why do you hate her as much as you do? But that's just the thing. With what should be redeeming qualities for her character, I just can't see them as that. Because despite there being some fairly good written parts about Juvia, I just can't overlook the biggest problem of her character. And that is her behavior. And I've tried to avoid talking about it throughout this video because I kind of have a lot to say about it and I wanted to just group it all in together. When I first started to become more active online, even before having this YouTube channel, I was very confused as to why so many people liked Juvia. It seems most, or at least a majority, of people who are interested in fairy tale liked Juvia. I read a lot of people saying that Juvia is cute or that it takes like a girl liking a guy and turning it into more like a girl power moment. Even some people saying that like Grey is a jerk for not acknowledging her romantic feelings for him. And I very strongly disagree. Here's a little bit of fairy tale trivia for you. Juvia wasn't originally intended to be as major of a character as she is. She was essentially planned to just not be incorporated into the plot anymore after the Phantom Lord arc. But then due to the popularity of her character, Hiromashi ended up writing her into more of the story. And honestly, that's probably a big reason why she has so little personality aside from Grey, and why she's tied into the plot so little times for a reason outside of Grey, because she was essentially planned to fight Grey that one time, have the gag of her liking him, and then that be it. But instead of being able to take her feelings for Grey and take it into a much more digestible approach, I guess, <laughs> it very quickly became stale for me. And I don't understand how people can think it's cute, and I don't understand how people can think that it's a girl power moment. And I have always believed from day one that if the genders of Grey and Juvia were reversed, Juvia's character would be a lot more hated and a lot more people would call her out for her behavior. Let's say Juvia were a guy and Grey were a girl. Or if it was Grey doing all of these actions towards Juvia. Let's take a look at that scenario and go through Juvia's actions all throughout the course of Fairy not just the single part, from the moment she's introduced 
to the moment fairy tale ended. Guy likes girl. He ends up stalking girl, following her, not only to her place of work, but also to other places where girl is supposed to be on vacation, enjoying herself, having a good time. He immediately dislikes other guys because he thinks that they might try and quote unquote steal a girl away from him. Girl has made many protests about the way that the guy treats her. She doesn't like his advances. She thinks that he's creepy. He makes her uncomfortable, but he just completely disregards that and just continues doing whatever he wants and saying whatever he wants. We see the guy's room and there is just pictures of the girl everywhere, stuffed animals of the girl everywhere. The girl is on his towels. He has a loofah made of the girl and he ends up living with the girl not because of any desire from the girl to have him live with her, but because he went there and refused to leave. That is all Juvia's behavior towards Grey and yet somehow it's just accepted and that's fine. And people have used the comic relief thing a lot, right? Like they'll pull the comic relief card. Like it's just supposed to be funny, it's supposed to be silly, and it's supposed to be lighthearted. Let me raise you. Take that scenario I just presented. All of Juvia's behavior is the same, except she's a guy and Grey is a girl. And it's still presented under the pretense of being comedic relief. While some people might give it a pass, most people would still call out the toxic behavior and the unhealthy behavior, despite there being the pretense of comedic relief. That guy character in that scenario would not get a pass for that, and I don't think Juvia should either. And it would be an entirely different scenario if Juvia was presented as a character that you aren't supposed to like, and if she was presented as a character with an unhealthy obsession and presented as a character of, this is not how romance should be, this sort of behavior isn't okay. But she's not. She's presented as a character that we're supposed to root for, and she's presented as a romantic interest that we're supposed to want to see Grey get with. All of this behavior is just completely romanticized, and despite there being a discomfort from one of the parties, this is still a romance that is being pursued and written, but it's toxic, and it's unhealthy, and it's not funny. There are so many women characters that are written for the sole purpose of being a love interest for a male character, and Juvia takes that to an extremely unhealthy degree. Because I don't care if it's supposed to be comedic relief, to me it's not funny. And I am a very big believer in gender equality for all genders, and a big part of gender equality is calling out female characters for poorly written stuff like this. Because like I said, if Juvia were a guy and Grey were a girl, or if it was Grey doing all of these things to Juvia, people would not stand for it. People would call it out and people would take a very big issue with Juvia's character, and so I don't see why that isn't happening with Juvia. There are parts of Juvia's character that I like, but I just can't bring myself to like her despite that because of how romanticized her toxic and honestly sometimes abusive behavior is. And that is why I don't understand why she's as popular of a character as she is. Well, I've been recording this audio for like an hour now. <laughs> I have no idea how long this video is going to be. If you managed to make it this far, Thanks. <laughs> I hope this didn't really come off as a rant and I hope it came off more as like a dissection of Juvia's writing, but you can let me know which one it turned out to be. <laughs> Honestly, a big part of the reason why I don't like Juvia as much is it, it's probably because I'm a writer <laughs> and I think that there are a lot of poorly written aspects of Juvia, which really ticks me off, but you can let me know if you disagree. If you are one of those people who really like Juvia, then feel free to let me know. Let me know why. And if you are somebody who also doesn't like Juvia, let me know if there's any other reason from what I said in this video that you don't like her. Was that a sentence? I don't know. I've been recording for an hour and I need to stop. <laughs> I really like doing these sort of dissection videos and at this moment I don't have any other characters on this list that I would like to sort of dissect the writing of but I'm definitely open to making these videos in the future and if another topic like this comes up I'd be more than happy to make a video about it and if you have any other characters that you'd like me to look into let me know and maybe a video will happen because I really like making these videos I'm really happy that you guys are liking them too and I mentioned them in the beginning but if you do want to see more videos like this from me I have two already one of them is about Jihiro Fujisaki from Danganronpa. I go into the debate of whether or not Jihiro's writing is transphobic or if it's a commentary about breaking out of gender stereotypes. I also made a video breaking down the character design of Athena Sykes from Ace Attorney. That one is a little bit more artsy than narrative, I guess you could say, considering it's about character design, but both of those videos were really fun for me to make, so I'll leave those in the eye card for you if you want to see those. And that's about all I have for this video, so if you liked it, give this video a thumbs up. Let me know if there are points you agree on, points you disagree on. I feel like this video is a weird combination 
combination of both fact and opinion, so let me know your thoughts. <laughs> and if you are new here, hello, my name is Oliver. If this is the first video you're seeing of mine, consider subscribing. I'd love to have you. I make a lot of art videos on here, and hopefully I'll start making this sort of content a little bit more often, so if you're interested in any of those, consider subscribing. I also talk a lot about my own original characters, so I'd appreciate it if you checked those out. And if you want to see more from me, you can follow me on social media. Those will be on screen now and linked in the description box below. I'm not as active on there as I used to be, but I still post art on there. I tend to give updates on videos on Instagram, and I tend to just share my stupid thoughts on Twitter, so if those are interesting to you, go follow me over there. And there will be some videos on screen now and linked in the iCard for you to check out if you want. I really appreciate it. Thank you so, so much, and I'll see you in the next video, hopefully. <laughs> Bye.